What makes your mom happy? Uh, me. Playing with you. When we help her clean the house. When she sees me win something. Clean the room. Whenever I hug her. What makes your mom mad? I don't go to bed. Not cleaning my room and not doing stuff that she told me to do. My dad says he's going to do something, but he never does it. Burning yourself on the oven. What is something your mom does every day? Uh, reads her Bible. Um, watches TV. Cleans. Uh, clean. Cleaning the house. My mom always cleans the house. Sometimes washes the dishes. What is something your mom always says to you? Be good to your friends. She usually says, clean up my room. How was your day whenever I get home from school? She says, little best. She loves me. I love you. How old is your mom? 61. Uh, she's 30. 21. I think she's 60. <laughs> she's like this month, but now she turned like this month, so she's zero. What is your mom's favorite thing to do? Read. Play with me. Spend time with us. Color. Chat with me. Hang out with me. Um, go to church. What is your mom's favorite place to go? To me town go. The spa. To my cousin's house. Starbucks. The church. How are you and your mom the same? We both have tan skin. Both of our favorite colors are red. Well, we both like to read. We both have freckles. Um, mommy has two eyes that that matches one eye of me because um, I have two colored eyes as my daddy. How are you and your mom different? She has blonde hair, I don't. She works most of the time and I play most of the time. That way you don't have the same eye color. She cooks very well and I can't. She has big hair and I don't. I wake up early and long, uh, wakes up late. What is your favorite thing about mom? She's pretty. She always hugs me. That she takes me fun places. That she loves me. She says I love you. That she loves me and she takes care of me. How do you know your mom loves you? Because she tells us that every day. Because she gives me a hug and a kiss every night before bed. Because she smiled at me. By giving me a hug and kiss. I know why, because she gives us kisses. Because she always makes macaroni, because I love that. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. You're the best. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I love you, Mommy. Good morning and welcome to the River Christian Fellowship. We're so glad that you could join us today. Today we have special guest speaker, Dr. Ted Baer. He is the founder and publisher of Movie Guide. That's the family guide to movies and entertainment and chairman of the Christian Film and Television Commission Ministry, as well as noted critic, educator, lecturer, and media pundit. His life's purpose is to be used by God to redeem the values of the media while educating audiences on how to use discernment in selecting their entertainment. We can't wait to hear what Dr. Ted has to bring to us today. We'll be starting the service in a few moments, so go ahead, get your Bible, and get ready to join the River Christian Fellowship.
Happy Mother's Day. Holy Spirit, bless me, bless the speech, bless the keynote, bless the preaching, everything we do, and bless the mothers here in Jesus' name. What a great worship service. I speak at a lot of different events, some places that are very dry, like the House of Lords at Parliament in England, but this was a nice Holy Spirit experience. The singing here was wonderful, and now I'm going to give feedback, so I'm in trouble. Okay. Well, God bless you. And, uh, you know, I want to say that we're not just addressing the mothers, uh, but the fathers and everyone else. And we're concerned about the next generation, and we're concerned about our country. We're concerned about what we do. I'm going to tell you some great news to make you happy. I'm going to tell you some news that will help you grow and help you help your children and grandchildren grow who left here, I'm sorry to say. So I want to see you transform the culture. Jesus answered, can you see it up there? The works I do in my Father's name to testify to me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one, is, um, and no one can snatch it out of my Father's hand. My Father and I are one. When I think about that, I have four children and 14 grandchildren scattered all over the world. And my daughter, when she was young, was a member of 4-H. You've probably never heard of 4-H, in Iowa, right? Is that, is that true? And uh, she raised sheep. Actually, she raised a couple of goats and liked those better. But the sheep, when she went to the county fair, would always follow her. They'd always come when they called. They loved her. I don't know why she liked uh, goats better, because goats were just ornery and would always come up and butt me and make it hard for me to feed them. But anyway, she, she liked the sheep. Isn't that the way it is? You know, you have to train them up in the way they should go. So who was the only, for Mother's Day, who was the only woman in the New Testament called a disciple? Anybody? Give me a guess. Who was called a disciple? What woman? Mary Magdalene. No. Give me another guess. The woman at the well. No. What? Come on, you know your word. You know the word of God written. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, called Dorcas in Greek. And Tabitha was pretty wealthy. She was giving a lot of charity. She had an upper room. Very few people had an upper room. And she died. And they put her in the upper room for her wake, as you can see up there. And then they called for Peter to come. And Peter was nearby. He was uh, very close. So he came, and he sent everybody out of the room, which reminds me of what Jesus did. He always sent everybody out of the room. And then he prayed in the name of Jesus. And then he said, Tabitha, you know, get up. And Tabitha got up. So he called her by name. The Bible is full of us calling each other by name, God calling us. So we listen for his call. And you know the shepherd psalm backwards and forward, the 23rd psalm. Is that right? Everybody know it? You know, if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So God is our shepherd. He provides for us. He gives us rest. He gives us hope. He gives us a future. He protects us when we go through trials and tribulations, when the sound doesn't work, when the video doesn't work, when all of that happens, you know, God is always with us. Is that right? Is God with you? Are you awake this morning? Is he your shepherd? Okay, so he provides for you. I love this passage that he gives you a table in the presence of your enemies uh, because that table, we give thanksgiving. And the Greek word for thanksgiving is one of my favorite words. It's the word Eucharist. And inside the word Eucharist are two words. It's like one of those Russian dolls. There's a word within a word within a word. And the word inside it is charis. Anybody know charis, charisma? You ever heard of that? I'm going to take a nap for a while. <laughs> okay. So it's a gift. When you give thanks, you get a gift. And inside the word charis is the word car, which means joy. So when you give thanks, you get the gift of joy. And he's telling you to come before his table to come here into communion, into community, 
to worship him, to give thanks, to get the gift of joy. And that's why I love the music that you did today. You did really great music. I'm very proud of you. You know, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in Hollywood. My ministry is in Hollywood. I'll explain that. But you did a tremendous job. I grew up in the entertainment industry. My parents were movie stars. My father starred in 62 movies. And then after World War II, he starred on Broadway for a long time. He won the box office award in 1936, so he was a big star. And he was nominated for Academy Award for playing Lafayette in the life of Lafayette. And my mother was a star. But my mother died when I was young. So I went off the deep end. I did a lot of drugs. I looked for love in all the wrong places, all the wrong places. I'll repeat that, all the wrong places. And I became very anti my parents were not Christian, but whatever I thought God was, he couldn't be very good if my mother died. And of course, if you read the lives of some of the other people like C.S. Lewis, he felt the same way when his mother died when he was young. He was angry at God for years. And then finally, four women who had come to Christ through the Billy Graham, uh, the big Billy Graham crusade in New York, they went after my father. One of them had a crush on my father. The other three were married. They were good friends of mine. And they would take my father to Christian events and Christian churches. And he'd take me to protect him from these four women because he was really cute. And I'd go with him and then I'd walk out after 10 or 15 minutes and say, these people are crazy. And then I became one and I knew they were crazy. And I was crazy after that point. But one of the women asked me, why don't you just read the Bible and tell me what's wrong with it? You went to Dartmouth, you graduated summa cum laude in your major, you went to Cambridge, University of Bordeaux and Toulouse, University of Munich, a lot of other places which I graduated from, and then I went to NYU Law School. So I said, why don't, and I was actually a, a member of the group that represented the Chicago Seven, and none of the people in the movie looked like the people that were actually representing them in real life. They had much more handsome people in the movie. Believe me, the movie has nothing to do with reality. But after months of waiting and saying, no, 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 I read the Bible, and halfway through Matthew, I came to Christ. And I don't, you know, testimony by the testimony, you will know. And what happened is that 60% of the people, according to Wycliffe, Bible translators, come to Christ through reading the Bible. Some really famous people. You know, famous people like C.S. Lewis that I just mentioned. And so when he did, I decided I needed to learn more about Christianity since I hadn't grown up in Christianity. By the way, the um, drugs stopped. Some of my friends had lost their lives and their minds and the drugs. It was a heavy duty in Hollywood and Broadway at that time. All the salacious activity stopped. If you don't know what salacious means, come up to me afterwards and I'll tell you what it means. I got married to my wife and I decided that I'd go to a mainline cemetery in New York. Oh, it's a seminary. <laughs> but they were all deader than a doornail, so, you know, I call it a cemetery. And that denomination, related to a denomination in England, had been given the rights for the C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Has anybody heard of The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Has anybody seen the movie? Has anybody? Well, the fr we, they were trying to do the movie from 1954 to 1979 when I became head of the organization. And we got it on CBS, and it won an Emmy Award, and it had uh, 37 million viewers at a time when the United States was only 170 million people. Today, it's 340 million people. You can't even get 37 million viewers today. We're not talking about coverage, Shannon. We're talking about viewers, actual people watching the show. And I said, you know, I grew up with a father who was famous. After the plays, you know, I'd be around until 2 in the morning while he was reading the reviews and people were congratulating him. And then I'd get home. We took the train home to Long Island. And then I'd go to school in the morning exhausted and fall asleep like I almost did here a little while ago. No. I'm, I'm glad you're out there. And I said, how can we change Hollywood? So we started because that was where I grew up. And I had funded five... Now, uh, feature films that started Canon Films. One of them was Oliver Stone's first film, and it was a really bad film. Don't look up on IMDb Pro. 
uh, Oliver Stone's first film because you won't like it at all. So I said, what we're going to do is first we're going to help parents choose the good. And we started doing Movie Guide. We started reviewing 100% of the movie, owing, owing, earning $750,000 or more. And we reached a lot of people. Last year we were at 37 million. I needed to move off that because that was the same as Lion, the Witch, Order. This year we're 41 million. We went from 37 to 41 million, measured on a lot of secular stations and things, to find out what was good. And we looked at movies not in the simple way. We didn't do reviews, you know, like Robert Roger Ebert, who uh, at one point confessed that he didn't like children's movies. You know, if you went into a store that doesn't exist anymore, Blockbuster, and you look at Roger Ebert's titles, they were very salacious. I'm not going to tell you what salacious means if you don't know what it means. He hated kids' movies. But we look at movies economically, philosophically, historically. Uh, that's for the ben benefit of Brandon back there. Uh, Brandon's off with the youth class. Intellectually, all 150 criteria. Because to put myself through seminary, I was director of the TV department at City University in New York. And the City University of New York was 210,000 students with 50,000 students in TV. Now, somebody at the hotel yesterday told me that there were only 50,000 people in Great Falls, in Twin Falls. So, uh, that was the number of people in TV. Try to remember all of their names. But a group of professors there got together and put together the first media literacy course, and they started looking at media and television in terms of all this criteria. And what we found out is that great movies are great stories well told. You know, I teach classes. I was teaching at Berkeley. I hate to mention these secular schools because I know you're probably upset by them, but I had a big class. I was head of a department at Berkeley. They're great stories well told. Every kid thinks he can make a movie, and they can't have a positive worldview. It has to have a positive worldview because most people have tough lives. My wife has been on uh, chemo drugs and infusions for 25 years for a serious problem. Uh, Shannon just had uh, her retina uh, you know, pulled loose and then she had to have that repaired. All of those things are the problems we face. We want movies that are positive. I keep saying to Christian filmmakers, stop making hospital films. My wife doesn't want to sit and watch a hospital film after 25 years. And sometimes, you know, 90 minutes in heaven turns about 90 minutes in the hospital and one minute in heaven, which is not the way it's going to be eternally. And they have to be spiritually uplifting. So actually, we see movies that are spiritually uplifting that reach every corner of the world. When we started doing all this, there was only one movie with positive Christian content. That was Trip to Bountiful. At that point, when we started doing it, if you saw somebody who was a priest or a minister, usually they're priests because they're easier to recognize, they had a knife in their hand and they were about to kill somebody, poltergeist uh, comes to mind. Now, about, I'll show you clips from them just so you can see it, about 66% of the movies have at least some positive Christian moral values. Not that the movies are good, but we'll see how that happened in a minute. Of the top 10, I was worried about last year. I said streaming, the bad movies for the first time since we've been doing all this analysis in the 1980s are gonna do better in streaming. And the bad movies did not do better in streaming. In fact, what did better in streaming were family movies, and why did they do better in streaming? Because the heart of the country is not in Hollywood. It's here. You're the people who make the decision. You have the power. The most powerful person in Hollywood is not Eisner or Iger or any of those people who think that they have power. The power is you. If you choose the good like this, the good will do better. Is anybody happy about this? I mean, this testifies to the heart of the country that is much more faithful than anybody in Hollywood or the news media would admit. I think it's good news. And that's because every week before COVID and the shutdown, 123 million people went to church a week and only 23 million people went to movies. So you're five times more than the people going to movies. And you make a difference. 
Actually, about 65% of the frequent moviegoers are Christians. Now, you know, you're in a very on-fire denomination or church, so you say, well, those must be mainline Christians. Probably, but everywhere I go, you know, I ask people, uh, have you seen Godzilla versus King Kong? And anybody see Godzilla versus King Kong here? Yeah, a couple of people. And um, if there are more of the youth who are in here, they've all seen Godzilla versus King Kong. Believe me, it's, it's big. And Christians go to movies, usually in the same proportion as non-Christians, and you have the power to make good choices. But there's more at stake than profits, which we tell Hollywood, if you make movies that reach this audience, you'll do better at the box office. And in spite, you know, Hollywood makes movies on two levels. On one level is to win awards. And those are really swarmy, terrible movies. And the other level is to pay the bills, because there are over 60,000 people that work at Warner Brothers in LA, and they need to pay their bills. Disney needs to pay the bills. So they need these big movies. But as Walt Disney said, movies have a tremendous influence on young lives. And the most concerned about the influence is the most educated. That's why I think I was the head of the department at uh, City University of New York, head of a department at Berkeley, because they're concerned because the more intelligent you are, the more influenced you are. Think about that, Shannon. If your children are intelligent, they're more influenced by the media. So every day, just earlier in the week, I got a call from somebody. They said, my child is very smart, one in the class, just got depressed by COVID, got into cutting. The more intelligent you are, see that they were raised as a Christian. After the show that I did, there were a couple of people who responded to me, the Mike show, saying, you know, my son, he's gone off the deep end. What can you do? He's 23. He was raised in the church. He's going to graduate school. We're losing the next generation. Anyway, the more educated, the more concerned you are. There have been over 500,000 studies. We can go through all the studies, but we we'll take more time than the Holy Spirit will give me today. So we'll just cut to the quick. By the time a child is 17 years old, they spend 66,000 hours with the mass media. They will see over 23 million hours of commercials. They go to school for 11,000 hours. The good news about COVID, the time with parents goes up. This has came from Cornell and probably, uh, but when normal school year, the school occupies so much of their time that the parents don't get, the moms don't get enough time with them and church for 800 hours if they go every single Sunday from the time they're born. Now, my mother was born in Texas, in a little town of Hunt and Ingram, tiny little town. And at that time, in 1906, the way you learned is from your parents and from a one-room schoolhouse and from your church. So this has changed the country tremendously. And 66% of the young girls I can tell you examples, feel worse about themselves when they see models and celebrities on TV. This breaks my heart because of my 14 grandchildren, 11 of them are young girls. And God loves each one of them. And God thinks each one of them is beautiful. But we have a standard which even models and celebrities, I used to have a little clip showing how they're embarrassed, how they don't like watching other people, how they think they don't measure up. Nobody thinks they measure up. Talk about low self-esteem. This is a serious problem because when girls get low self-esteem, they engage in aberrant behavior, which is very serious. And according to Cornell University a few years ago, 90% of the children are abandoning the Christian faith and values of their parents. 90%. Has anybody had this happen in their family? Their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, relatives? It's a very serious issue. We're losing the next generation. Two of my sons went to Wheaton. You know, that was Billy Graham's college. When the first one was there, it was extremely solid, the class that was there. By the next one, the class had gone off the rails. We're losing the next generation. So the media, the education, the kids, they're being brainwashed, they're being taken in a different direction. And how did this happen? Well, during the golden age of Hollywood, when Mr. Smith went to Washington, which you don't remember because you're all young, 
And it was a wonderful life, and the bells of St. Mary rang out across the land. The church was the dominant influence in Hollywood. They didn't have censorship power, but they were the ones who spoke to the studios. They said, do you want people to come to your movies? They kept movies 100% cleaner than G-rated movies from 1933 to 1965. And then the church started retreating from Hollywood. In 1965, the Protestant Film Commission shut down. I inherited all the files of the Protestant Film Commission. And you went from 100% G-rated to 82% R-rated in three years. You went from The Sound of Music, which is a wonderful movie, to the first X-rated movie in three years. Evil will triumph when good men do nothing. You went from the greatest story ever told, a wonderful movie about Jesus, to the first sex and Satanism film in three years. Why did Hollywood go south? Why did it go in this bad direction? Because the church retreated. I don't read in the Bible that we're supposed to retreat. Do you? Do you see that anywhere in the Bible? We're supposed to occupy. We're supposed to advance. We're supposed to go forward. We're supposed to lead people to Christ. We're supposed to be salt and light. And if you take the salt from the meat, what happens? Yeah. You've got a big problem now. So we're living with the consequence of the churches retreating. And when I go to churches, they say, well, we shouldn't be involved in Hollywood, or we shouldn't do this. We were the difference. Are you saying we shouldn't be in a mission field? My son was a missionary in Papua New Guinea. We should stop being missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Another son now lives in Tasmania. We shouldn't be missionaries in Tasmania. Papua New Guinea had headhunters. So, oh, don't go there. You better stay at home and Twin Falls. Don't make a difference in the world. Don't go to Hollywood. That's really dangerous. A lot of headhunters there. Usually they're hiring people that I don't know for jobs that I don't want. So America changed. Thank you. We got new scripts of behavior. You know, the divorce rate had been flat. I don't want to be too heavy-handed or anything. But for years, it was flat. It was around 6%. It was under 10%. Suddenly, when Hollywood changed, unwed births went up. A friend of mine, Dr. Judith Reisman, just died, wrote all the best stuff on the impact of pornography. Divorce, divorce went up, prison population went up, welfare spending. And each one of us in this room owes over $200,000 a year to take care of these problems that were created because we abandoned the media to the adversary. Anybody have over $200,000 a year that can do that? I don't make that half that much. How did this happen? Because we abandoned the mission field. So the solution starts with you. We need to teach children how to be media wise because they're the most powerful force. You know, if they go to good movies, well, good movies will triumph or go to good television. And we need to redeem Hollywood. First, we work to redeem Hollywood. We do what the old church film offices do. We do this big banquet in Hollywood and we give them this tremendous report to the entertainment industry. And you're invited, if you wanna go all the way down to Hollywood, certainly Shannon's invited. We'd love to have you come down. But we only have a few people that aren't Hollywood people. We do this gigantic event and at the Oscars, you know, most of the movies being honored are movies about abuse, movies about bestiality, movies about bad stuff. And ours are the movies that contain, like uh, Lion King in the middle of it, As Great as Thy Faithfulness, and um, Lego Movie and others came up and talked about their church. Well, one of them went to Calvary Church in uh, Thousand Oaks. They talked about their faith. And these were the movies that were making over a billion dollars. So they're people of faith and values. Do we have sound? We are all made in God's image. And certainly these performances have expressed that aspect most beautifully.
put this man up there with the greats. James is the pillar of this movie. His ability to transcend and let God's light come through him and is the reason I am honored to stand in front of you tonight. It is also the reason that I am giving this award to him. just gotten on fire for doing the good, the true, and the beautiful, for reaching families, for making films that have more family content, and we thank you for all the impact that you've had, because you make the world a better place. So this is what we show Hollywood. Can you read that? Movies with Christian faith and values does better at the box office. I'm going to show you a few more clips, Shannon. I'll try to keep my mic from interfering with this mic. And then when you put non-Christian, you lose about a third. The more sexual content, the less money you make. I think, you know, I'm happy about this. This, this is not what we do. We measure, and we measure everything so we know what's happening. The more foul language, the less money you make. And the percentage of movies with positive Christian content since we've been doing the gala has increased tremendously. Is anybody happy about this or are you just... Yeah. Are we all hungry? We want to go. Yeah. So, you know, this is Tom Hanks' movie. He did two great movies last year. News of the World, I think, was written about my family. But this movie, Greyhound, was about a young man, he's put in the head of a destroyer to take the convoy over to England to save England in World War II. He prays at the beginning and throughout the movie and witnesses to Jesus. You want me to do it again? I'll do it again. I just want you to hear what he's saying. All the signs are witnessing to Jesus. Movies with faith and values. How many saw Wonder Woman? Nobody. One person, okay. Well, Wonder Woman at the end of the movie is about a father who's gone off the rails who decides that his family is more important than getting the whole world to follow him. It's also about truth. <laughs> You took the short pass. You cheated, Diana. That is the truth. That is the only truth, and truth is all there is. And this is one of the biggest movies in streaming, The Old Guard. Did anybody see it? Okay. You praying? doesn't exist. My God does. And we have a lot of people who come to Christ through the gala. Don't worry, I'll stand further back. We see friends. So I've had communists, atheists, all sorts of people come to Christ. This is good news. The next person you see has done over 150 movies. He did the number one miniseries on ABC. He's directed some powerful movies. And you'll hear his story. Hi, my name is Cyrus Narasta. I'm a writer and director. Uh, my movies include the miniseries The Path of 9-11 for ABC, The Stoning of Soraya M, The Young Messiah, Focus Features, and my latest film uh, stars Jim Caviezel, and it's entitled Infidel. Well, you know, I grew up of Muslim origin. You know, Movie Guide honored uh, the miniseries I did in 2006, and I went to the Movie Guide event and that was an important day in my life. Coming into sort of the movie guide community was eye-opening for me and was sort of part of my faith journey to Christianity. And I think you see it in my movies, I think you see it in my life, and it's, it's had a huge impact. 
So he did a couple of movies like The Young Messiah after coming to Christ, and then he did Infidel with Jim Caviezel. And um, this is a scene in the heart of Infidel when he's in Egypt. Anybody see Infidel? It was number one for about three weeks. You're good. Oh, boy. I've got an audience out there. This is great. You smile, you laugh. This is great. And you sing well, so this is beautiful. Anyway, in this scene, he's on Egyptian television being interviewed by a Muslim. Cyrus was Muslim, and Jim Caviezel lays out the gospel. Muslims accept his birth to be that of a good man, a great teacher, one of God's miracles through Virgin Mary or Maryam. But he was so much more. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, we, we love Jesus Christ. What are you doing? So then he gets captured, and they want to kill him, and they take him off to Iraq and uh, Iran. And they... But Cyrus grew up in Iran. For him to go through this transformation is a testimony that God is working in Hollywood. Why do we want to redeem the media for the benefit of your children and grandchildren? We want to see you grow up in a better world. We don't want to see all the disinformation and the misinformation and the bad information and the constant eroding of our values. So it's nice to see people coming to Christ. It's nice to see them making a difference. A civilization that forgets how to tell its story dies. And from a period from 1965 till about 20 years ago, Christians forgot how to tell their story. They became insular, they retreated, they retreated into a, a little bundle. Not your church, but a lot of churches retreated. There's been a crash of the number of people going to, to church weekly. So we need to make a difference. We need to teach them. I teach people how to succeed in Hollywood without losing your soul. At those classes, I get the heads of studios, like I just had the head of the biggest studio in Hollywood that made the $200 million Godzilla movie that I mentioned, et cetera. And we see people take the class five days, and they go out, and they rewrite their script, and one of them got their script picked up by Ron Howard. We see them succeed. I want to see new people succeed. So this is him. Plus, one of my favorite people, just a great uh, person in terms of moving the world, in terms of doing videos and television, and he's always had a dream of making this movie about a strange guy named Murph the Surf. And then you took the class, the How to Succeed in Hollywood class without losing your soul. That was the most fantastic event of my educational career, and I have, I have four degrees after college. While we were out there at the, at the uh, workshop, uh, you had a lot of people from Hollywood come out, some pretty big performers, or they're literally some of one billion dollar uh, properties. But when I went to the class, I learned there's a very disciplined form you have to follow. If you don't follow it, the movie's going to get rejected, you're wasting your time. What happened as a consequence, you're now getting it made into two movies, right? A documentary yeah. and a movie. We actually have a contract with Ron Howard's group, Imagine Entertainment. We're doing a documentary and a feature-length film. I would suggest to anyone who is interested in the movie industry, anyone, uh, to take the class, the master class. Dom, you were a great student because then you submitted your script, we analyzed your script, and I'm glad you're gonna make a great script and a great movie, and we're here to support you all the way through. Thank you for taking the How to Succeed in Hollywood Without Losing Your Soul class, and Ron Howard, our good production team. So I'm praying for you, and praying that it's gonna be a tremendous success. So, the average movie in Hollywood takes 13 years, according to the LA Times. Now, most of you are in, don't understand why that would be. The average movie costs $104 million uh, to produce. Uh, Mulan costs $200 million to produce. It takes a long time to put together $104 million. If you think about it, Avatar, he keeps saying, I'm going to bring out the sequel. Top Gun, he keeps saying, I'm going to bring out the sequel. Uh, Indiana Jones, Spielberg, he keeps saying he's going to bring out the sequel. Some of those have been around 30 years waiting for them to bring out the sequel. So if I can teach 
a lot of people to make great movies. And we can teach, let's say if it takes 13 years, 13 people, then we have one a year. And we can teach more than that. You know, Alex Kendrick was my radio engineer. A lot of the people that are making movies now studied with us, attributed what they did to us, and we've made a difference. The most powerful person in Hollywood, I've told you a couple of times, is a 12 to 24 year old who goes to movies. And that is the person that you need to help to choose the good. Years ago, there was a psychiatrist that was dealing with a school system like New York, and they were saying that a lot of our kids are now coming in with ADD and all ADHD and uh, dyslexia. And uh, the school was prescribing, the school system was prescribing Ritalin. I don't know if any of you have encountered Ritalin and all of its derivatives, but it's not pleasant. And he said, just give me two months with the kids. So two months, he told the parents, you know, just limit their gaming to 30 minutes a week. Put them to bed early, give them nutritious meals. After the two months, 90% of the kids didn't show any signs of ADHD. Anybody hear me? This is a generation that was lost. 10% did because the parents said, I don't have time to talk with them for an hour. I don't have time to play with them. I don't have time to monitor. I don't have time to do this. So the big difference can be made. The keys to media wisdom, I told you about those professors when I was head of the Department of City University of New York that came together. Understand the influence of the media. I hope you all understand that. Uh, otherwise, I'll get you to read all 500,000 studies, some of them hundreds of pages long. Understand your children's stages of development. I'll do that quickly. Understand the grammar. Entertainment media works differently than what I'm doing now, although I'm trying to make this as visual as possible. But the entertainment media is visual. It's a visual media. So look at me, everybody, and put your hand on your chin. Would you do that? And almost 90% of you have your hand on your cheek because the visual dominates. How do I know that it dominates? Because I've got a slight heart problem. My heart doctor recommended Lipitor. I watched the commercial, the guy's in bed. He takes Lipitor, he's dancing with his wife in Hawaii. I thought, this is great, I take Lipitor and I get sent to Hawaii, you know, I could go after Mike and take over his place and then dance with my wife. However, I took Lipitor and I almost died. I was one of the 10% who didn't make it through Lipitor. I was rushed to urgent care. I had my stomach pumped and all that stuff. But the visual dominates. And it dominates with your children. Understand your moral, spiritual values. You get that in the church. Understand the answers like asking the right questions and how to make media-wise children. 75% of the people learn through the heart. That's why Jesus told parables. If you don't think telling stories is good, Jesus told parables. I still believe, courageous, overcomer, all those movies are telling parables. They're putting seeds like the parable of the prodigal son into people's heart so that people will grow up thinking about it. 25% eh, learn through the head and those are at the universities that I've been head of the departments. Keys to understanding. And when you look at a movie, you want to understand the doctrine of God. Is this God just this minor demigod from, you know, like Thor or like Loki, even worse? Or is God the God who created the universe, the God that you sang about here? Doctrine of man. Man cannot save himself. You sang about that. The doctrine of the church. It's Christ's body. It's the bride of Christ. Doctrine of history. Doctrine of reality is very important. Muslims believe that this is just in a material world. If it's a material world, it doesn't matter if you die. But for us, it matters. It's a real world, real pain, real suffering that needs a real savior. I won't go into all these. So children react differently at every stage of development. And you have to understand children at every stage of development to teach them to be media wise and to protect them. When they're two, zero to two, every major medical association says they shouldn't be using any media because they have to crawl. They have to learn. They learn through hand-eye coordination. They learn through walking. They learn through all of those things. 
There's a great example about that. I just looked at the article today. Last year in Atlantic Monthly, there was a whole article on Romania because Ceausescu wanted to be the best Marxist. Marx wanted to abolish the family and turn all the mothers into women of the night because he went off all the time. He wanted to get rid of the family. So Ceausescu thought, oh, this is great. So they took the children, they put them into orphanages. They didn't have enough people, so they strapped them in their crib for about five or six years. When they got out, they had severe learning difficulties because the kids cannot just be looking outside, looking at a screen. They got to be moving. They got to be working. They got to be playing. They got to be playing ball. From two to seven years old, the imagination stage, they confuse fact and fiction. When I was speaking in Washington State, is that near here? A little bit. Coeur d'Alene was near it, because I went and spoke in Coeur d'Alene after that. I was speaking at a big academic conference, and one of the people was the head of the academic department at University of Wisconsin. And she said, one of the things they did to study is they asked the senior graduating class, were you ever afraid of a movie when you were you know, young, two to seven years old. 90% of them said, yes, they were afraid. Some of them said Wizard of Oz. Most of them said Jaws. And the interesting said, they're still afraid. They don't want to go in the water. They didn't want to take their swim test. In Wisconsin, not to take your swim test because they think a shark's going to come out of the pool. It's crazy. But you know, that's putting in the, the little fears of our age, the demons of our age. Concrete operational stage. Uh, they look at the world legalistically. If the person in the movie doesn't get punished immediately for aberrant behavior, if they conduct something like the movies that were honored at the Oscar with abuse and things like that, and they get away with it, they think they can get away with it. You're teaching them to be criminal. So you have to ask the right questions. You have to have media-wise answers. What are the right questions? The right questions are like, who is the hero? Hacksaw Ridge is a hero who doesn't want to kill, but he wants to save lives. Is the hero somebody that manifests the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control? Or is it a hero who wants to kill and maim and mutilate? You've got to be able to tell the difference. How is love portrayed? In most movies, love is portrayed as lust. What's the difference between lust and love? Lust is always taking. Lust is never satisfied. Lust is never loving, but love is always giving. Love is always satisfied. I've been helping my wife for the 25 years of chemo, and I love her more and more day by day. That's our call, to love one another, not just to put up with one another. <laughs> Especially on Mother's Day, you've got to love mothers. So what can we give our children and grandchildren that is more valuable than a culture that honors Jesus Christ? I'll show you one more clip. I want to challenge you to think on whatever things are true, whatever things are noble and just, whatever things are pure and lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. Movieguide.org so Hollywood impacts your church and the next generation. We can impact Hollywood. You know, we're going to have books in the back that I'm going to sign for you. But I want to tell you one more quick story. It was Ronald Reagan's favorite story. It was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's favorite story. It's about Telemachus. Does anybody know about Telemachus here? Okay, the Roman games were the entertainment in those days. And instead of showing killing and maiming and mutilating in the Avengers, they actually killed and maimed and mutilated people all over the Roman Empire, all the way from Spain to Persia, throughout North Africa. It says when Pilate came to uh, Israel to show that he was in charge, there were 62,000 people killed in the game in about a week. So Telemachus was living way off in the corner of the Roman Empire. Maybe it's like Idaho to Washington. He walked all the way from the corner of the Roman Empire all the way to Rome, months and miles of walking. He was probably in what we call Hungary today. And he got there, and he couldn't afford a good seat at the Colosseum. He went up to the cheap seats. God had called him there. 
And he saw what was happening, and he was just upset. He said, stop in the name of Christ. And of course, this was their entertainment. Nobody wanted to stop their entertainment. Why would you want to do that? So he jumped into the arena, and he said, stop in the name of Christ. And all the people said, kill him. Oh, he's more entertainment. We could just kill this guy who's ruining our fun like the preacher today. Thank you. <laughs> and as they ran him through with a sword, you see it there. And as he was dying, he looked up at Emperor Honorius and he said, stop in the name of Jesus Christ. And for the first time in almost a thousand years, Emperor Honorius, who was not a good guy, stopped the games on January 1st, and there never was another game all the way from Spain to Persia throughout the Roman Empire. Because one person jumped into the arena. So why did President Roosevelt love that story? Why did President Reagan love Because we're asking you to jump into the arena. Jump into the arena by teaching your kids to be media-wise. Jump into the arena by helping your grandkids. Jump into the arena by making a difference through your radio stations. I'm proud of you. You are actually doing what I ask churches to do, to make a difference. You're at the forefront of making a difference. You're at the forefront of jumping into the arena to tell people the truth of Jesus Christ. Now you've got to tell more people. You've got to tell them that Jesus loves them and to stop all this aberrant behavior in the name of Jesus. We're here to help you. God bless you, and have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you'd like more information on Dr. Ted Bear, please look in the description section of today's video. We hope you have a blessed week, and we'll see you again here online next week at 10.30 a.m. God bless.